Hello and welcome back to Chili Frost for some more of Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration. I've just hooked up a, uh, another small nuclear power plant on Frost here because I was getting a bit fed up of the lack of power in, in the uh, in the base. And I've been trying to expand it out a bit, um, having done a bit of um, poking around and looking at what the next science is going to require. So here we go, I've, got it, I've just hooked it up and started it running and as you can see the temperature of the reactor is now gradually climbing um, and the fuel is depleting at about the same sort of speed. So, so hopefully at some point fairly soon we'll start getting the heat passed out along these heat pipes. Um, if I had to hover over them, yeah they've got up to about 107-108 degrees so they're just about hot enough to boil water now. And I've also um, hooked up all the, the, uh, the water supplies to, them, to these nuclear plants as well. Now, if this plant looks quite familiar, that'll be because it's, it's exactly the same as the one on Norvis, with a couple of ex a couple of slight exceptions. Uh, one is that it's vertical instead of horizontal. That's a fairly big, but that's just a cosmetic change. It doesn't really doesn't really make any difference to the way it works. The big diff the big thing that's changed for it is down here at the bottom. I've added in um, all these tanks down here, and I've just realised the sound isn't working, so let me turn that on. There we go, that's the sound working again. So what I've done down here is I've hooked up these um, these tanks to the bottom end of the, um, of, of the what do you call it, steam turbines. So the theory behind this, and this is a little bit unrealistic, but it makes sense with Factorio physics, so let's not knock it. The theory behind this is that these uh, nuclear power plants, unlike every other, unlike sort of normal steam power uh, normal coal-fired steam plants, uh, don't stop burning fuel when they uh, when there's no demand on them. So this this fuel supply will always go down at this sort of speed, no matter what. Now on Norvis, I've sort of ignored that and just let it let it get through more fuel than is strictly required. But up here, I don't want it, I want it to be as hands off as possible. And I've got quite a big uh, uranium patch of about two and a bit million, so that should last me forever as long as I'm reasonably careful with power. So the way this works, in theory at least, is that these um, these nuclear power plants will produce power. The heat exchangers will boil the water, and hopefully. We've got water being yeah, we've got water coming in here. We haven't got steam coming out yet because it's not hot the um, nuclear plant isn't hot enough. But once we do, it'll start to power all of these um, steam turbines. But any excess steam that isn't needed will be passed out into these tanks up at the top here. Now I've wired in the actually the bottom set of tanks, which is unhelpful because we can't see that. I've I've wired in the bottom set of tanks to a red wire, or one of one of them at least, a red wire that runs up along these pylons and then goes to the inserters that put fuel into the um, into the nuclear reactors. Um, you can see it down here. So the theory is this will only load in if the steam is less than 15,000. Steam currently is less than 15,000, it's zero. So they've so we've loaded in as much fuel as we have. And we don't have much fuel, but I'll get on to why in a moment. Um, but now this is at about 400 degrees. Is that hot enough? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, no, apparently not. Uh, it's a bit of a shame. But the theory is that this will get eventually get this will get up, up to temperature and it'll start boiling the water and it'll, and then the um, because this is a relatively small base we won't be using all of the steam all of the electricity that's being produced by the steam so the turbines will some of them will spin down and the steam will make its way up through the turbines and into the tanks up here. This is where the sort of the dodgy physics comes in because in the uh, what that means the, the tanks will gradually fill up and once they get to 15,000 which is about which is 60% full then the uh, nuclear plants will stop being fed fuel um, so, and eventually that means they'll turn off and when that happens the turbines will carry on running based uh, using the steam that's built up in these tanks and that's the part that's slightly unrealistic it, uh, but I suppose we could we could imagine that the um, we're building up the pressure more and more and more and then only letting it out as it need, as it's needed so it sort of works I guess there's a little bit of um, realism in there not not a great deal but but at least a little bit <laughs> so that's it th so as I say the theory is then the the nuclear plants will all turn off when the um, when the steam level drops uh, gets above 15,000 and hopefully the load on the base will be such that the tank in the time between the tanks filling up from 15,000 to 25,000 the nuclear plants will burn through whatever fuel they've got in them and eventually turn off and then once they've um, once they've turned off and they and they and they start to cool down, the amount of steam in these tanks will keep it running, and then when it gets below fifteen thousand, the fifteen thousand will be sufficient for it for these to kick back in again and bring the power back up again. So I'm going to have to keep a bit of an eye on it and make sure it does all work. But then hope, but the, but the hope is once it's once it's up and working, it'll be completely fire and forget, and it'll get through a lot less fuel because we won't be 
endlessly wasting the, uh, the power in, the, in these plants. Now, is this hot enough to start making steam yet? A min temperature 500 degrees C, that's why it's not working yet. Oh, there we go, this one's kicked in. I don't know why this one has... There we go, that one's kicked in as well. So now we've got all these... Um, we've got the first first eight of these producing uh, producing power now. That's a good start. Uh, that one ran out already because that, no that didn't even have enough fuel in it to get it up to the required temperature to, to, to heat these up. Never mind. But yet these are gradually kicking in. If we look at power supply now... Yes, there we go. Satisfaction is finally full. This was at about 50% or so for ages, and it was it was terrible. Um, but now we've got production is easily more than we easily more than we need. That suddenly charged up all the accumulators really really quickly, so that's good as well. In fact, if I can if I can put some more accumulators in, that'll add a bit more um, a little bit more capacity for just balancing it all um, between between um, the power coming and the power going. And now at the top here, we've got the steam steam t uh, tanks at the top gradually filling up as well. So everything seems to be pretty much working. My biggest concern here is that each time these go, when these get turned on, they dump at least four um, fuel cells into the in, into the um, reactor. So I, I don't know if it's going if there's going to be enough enough of a buffer between the uh, in, in the in the tanks at the top. I may need to go up and put even more tanks on, but we'll we'll see how that goes in, in, in a little while. So the reason that um, there's no fuel cells on here is because I didn't plan ahead very well, though, which will <laughs> come as no surprise to you, I expect. Um, I didn't bring any of the uh, uranium-235 with me. Uh, 235, yeah, 235 is the, is the exciting one. So what I've had to do is set up this uranium mine here and then set up this massive bank of uh, centrifuges, which is processing the uranium ore. Um, but as you may or may not remember from last time I did this sort of shenanigans, it takes a while. So each time you each time you process some uranium ore, you get out. Well, there's a 99.3% chance you'll get out some 238, which is the dark coloured um, uranium, or and there's a uh, an, a 0.7 chance you'll get out the um, uranium 235, which is the bright coloured one that's a lot more exciting and, and is the one that you can actually use for convenient nuclear stuff. Now, actually, to be fair, you need a bit of each really. So. Then there's this thing called Coverex Enrichment, which is the next one, which takes 40 uranium 235s and 5 238s and produces 41 235s and 2238s. So that means when you start it going, you have to wait ages in order to, in order to get your first 40 uranium uh, uranium 235s. And once you've done that, which I've finally managed, and it's, this has only just started after being left for ages, once you've done that, you then have almost unlimited uranium. Because these these things will produce, um, they will t they will essentially turn the two three eight into two three five, um, but they just require this big chunk of it. They require forty of it in order to get that started. So this is now is now working. Um, I need to leave this running now to produce another forty of them, which will take much less time. Actually, let's put these speed modules in it. Um, so this now passes passes it around in in a loop here. This is not the most efficient way, but I, I don't care. It'll work. Um, so this will pass pass it around. It'll run it'll run the um, the loop the the enrichment loop again, and then we can make some another two three five, and then, and then gradually we can make more and more. There we go. It's running again immediately now because it didn't need to wait for it all to be produced by these centrifuges. So that's now we're over the biggest hurdle of this of this of this system. So we now just need to wait for this to, this to produce another forty, and then I can put another one on. And then when they've produced another forty between them, I can have another, and it'll and then once I get to the point where I've got four or five of them producing uranium, uh, producing the 235, I can then start feeding some of the excess into this machine down here, which is making the um, the new uranium fuel cells for the nuclear reactors. And then everything will be hunky-dory and it'll be it'll, it'll be absolutely great and I won't need to worry about it again because this is a... Uh, oh, it's actually it's less than two million. I thought it's only... It was a, it probably was about one million when it started. Um, and this will last me forever because it, because there's so... If you look in here, I've got 4.8 thousand in there and another 63 in there. So actually that's done quite well to um I think I've been quite fairly lucky there to produce 40 uranium 235s with only 5000 with less than 5000 238s. Uh so the point is the this is an enormous amount of of uranium and will keep the system going for forever or pretty much or it still feel like forever. Um well, now that I've got enough to keep this buffering. And since I'm only using it for power and I'm trying to be a little bit more efficient over here we should, we should, um, yeah, things should, should, things should go well. Okay, so that's nearly, 
nearly half full. It's more than halfway to the uh, 10,000 I requested. That one's run out of fuel. This one's got... I can't tell. Come on, show me how much fuel you've got. Oh, it's got two, two and a bit left in it. So... I, I still don't know. <laughs> we, we shall we shall wait and see how that goes. Now what I'm going what I could do here is grab some of these two three fives out of this system because there's there's now as you can see there's four, four more than than is absolutely required, which is good. Just about, let's do that as well. Um, so I, I can just try and streamline this process a bit. Just get try and get that uranium as quickly as I can. But while that's running, I'm going to talk about the other thing I've been doing uh, while I've been up here. And that is, I've built up a barrel mine. And that is because if we, if we look at this, um, <laughs> actually this is uh, me being slightly, not not reading things properly uh, once again. But uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So if you look at this this, this uh, pretty diagram I've made here, I decided I want to start making um, astronomic science number one. I picked that fairly arbitrarily, I have to admit. But um, it seemed like a, as good a place as any to start. So in order to make this, you need... Beryl, beryl, beryllium plates. You need significant data, astronometric, astronomic catalogues, astronomic insights, and some ultra cold thermofluid. Now, I haven't actually looked into how to make this ultra cold thermofluid yet, but the rest of it I've sort of tracked back. And as you can see, a lot of a lot of these things all basically just come back to getting lots of astro catalogues and then processing and processing and processing them. So, in order to get those, I need to get various types of um, telescope data. So I need, and for that, I need to start making up um, various frames and 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 so on. Now, the most of this is actually going to be relatively straightforward, I think. All of the um, the frames and things are just, I think, are just made in normal assembly machine or well, space assembly machine. It's probably the massive uh, space manufacturer. It's not the not the little ones, uh, but it shouldn't be too difficult to make any of that. The slightly fiddly part is, is, as I said, going to be the thermofluid, and the fact I'm going to have to start making telescopes to make the to to expose the blank frames that I make to turn them into the the UV frames and and so on. Um, oh, I've missed date, missed out on how to make data cards. I'm going to look into that. The other thing is um, is the barrel plates to go into it as well, um, and that's basically this is this feels sort of somewhat angel bobby if I'm being honest, because this is this sort of long string of processes you have to run through to get from your ore to your um, to your final plates, and so I've built up a system down here, sort of the so I've got my main I've got the bus over here that was producing the, this first part of it was producing the um, the, the shells for my um, Water can, my water cannon, no, my ice cannon, and then the other half of it was is producing the uh, cryo cryonite. So over here, I've got a second thing. It's basically the same thing as the cryonite processing. It takes in the um, beryl ore, or the beryl ore here produces crushed beryl, which we then uh, have to wash. This one has to be washed in sulfuric acid rather than water. But fortunately, I was already making sulfuric acid over here for the. Um, Oh goodness knows what I was making this for. Um, oh, it was one of the steps in the cryonite processing. Okay, that, that makes sense. So I've already got that on, on site, and I'm also, I'm also using that for the um, uranium mining, of course. So we wash that in the sulfuric acid. That produces water and um, other stuff as well. Let's go and have a look. So that I can say things slightly, with slightly more confidence. Uh, what was this one? So this produces um, beryllium sulfate and sand and water. So the water I've just shoved back out into these pipes that gets passed out into the onto the water bus where, you know, we just use whatever. Water can come from wherever. It's all exactly the same. It doesn't matter. The sand we're filtering off has a couple of things, a couple of ways for the sand to be used. One is it comes up here, it gets turned into glass, which gets turned into the, um, <coughs> into the low density structures to be turned into the delivery cannon capsules but that was backing up rather severely and stopping the rest of the process running so I've got another machine down here turning it into landfill so basically all of the left all of the excess stone that comes from the cryonite processing and the sand that comes from the beryllium processing we're just turning into um, into landfill because landfill's really really dense it takes 200 bits of sand and I think 50 bits of, or 50 bits of stone to make a single landfill and then you can fit I think it stacks up to 200, so you can stick you can stick about 9,000 in a chest. So that's going to keep going for ages. We don't need to worry about that filling up for a very very long time. <clears throat> and hopefully by the time it does, we're going to be turning it into glass to make into these um, delivery capsules. So um, yeah, the the um, beryllium sulfate was it sulfide? Beryllium sulfate. Yeah, that then gets passed into another chemical plant where it uses some water, which is 
somewhere for this to go and turns it into some other goo beryllium hydroxide which we can turn into beryllium powder and water uh, which we then cook into ingots and then I am um, sort of Without thinking, I then turned it to turn the ingots into plates, which is what these machines are doing. But it turns out you can't put plates in a delivery cannon capsule for because of reasons. So instead, I'm just feeding them round down here, the uh, the ingots down onto this um, onto this belt. I decided it was better to pipe the ingots down this way than to pipe the delivery cannon capsules up the other way. So they're being passed all the way down here through a bit of spaghetti, and I've got another delivery cannon here. And this one is going to be start is once I set it up, is going to start firing at my. Um, uh, my, my space station, the one in orbit over Norvis where I'm producing science um, and we're just going to use the delivery cannon capsules that we're making here um, and I've got another receiver dish here so I can do the usual thing of setting up a system that says when there's less than a thousand beryllium plates or whatever or ingots, sorry, or whatever I decide this, this cannon will start firing. So that should uh, should be relatively straightforward I think. I know, I know, famous last words but I think that should, should, be, a, should be a bit of a solved problem at this point Okay, I think that is is most of what I've been up to recently. The big thing was getting this beryllium in um, and to, and turning that into something useful. Oh, the the iron belt coming up here is to start is to feed this is to start making the um, uh, the nuclear power cells. Uh, that's just unfinished while I wait for there to be enough uranium. Otherwise, yeah, things are ticking over. Okay, I did build out some more um, solar power here. I know it's basically useless on this planet, but it's. I, I, I was kind of desperate while I was waiting for the uh, the nuclear to get up and, and ticking over to an extent where I could start using it. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically it. I've got the um, the nuclear power running, kind of. How are these doing? Yeah, twelve thousand. Okay, that's, that looks sort of all right. It's kind of as I'd expect. I can't really test it properly until I've got a proper flow of fuel coming through. But that's going okay. The uh, the beryllium is, is as I said is the main thing, and then getting off to go and do this um, this a astronomic science. And I'm assuming it's called astronomic because it's astronomically difficult. Um, so yeah, I do now need to look into how to make telescopes. I need to look out how, into how to make these data cards, or rather, I need to make sure these data cards are the same type. Oh, I mentioned a thing I'd overlooked somewhat. Uh, let's have a look at this because this is a bit. Typical of me not thinking things through properly. So this is this is where I was getting my information from. We see, um, yeah, I, uh, I, just, I I looked at the recipe for astronomic science pack one. It says it needs beryllium plates. It turns out there's a second recipe for it that's exactly the same, um, except it requires twice as much of each of these, and only produces one, whereas this one produces two. So. In hindsight, I'm actually quite glad I made that mistake because if, if if these recipes had been the other way around and I'd looked at this one first, I'd probably gone, okay, let's start, let's just start doing this. But because I've come here, spotted this one and I spotted it before I left Frost, that's the other important part, I guess, um, where there is also beryllium and uh, available. I got this, I got this, uh, set, this system set up, and so this is going to make it about essentially a quarter of the price to produce this uh, this um, astronomic science pack because this produces two of them and it only requires half as much of each of these inputs so this is going to be a massive saving in lots of resources so I'm actually quite glad I made that mistake <laughs> it's going to make it much much easier I'm going to need to look into making cold thermo uh, super hypercooled thermofluid whatever it's called uh, thermofluid minus 100 that one um, the cold stuff because I think I think I've got to minus 10 so far but I haven't got to minus 100 so I'm gonna to need to make these hyper coolers um, actually that's not too bad I'm not too bothered about that uh, significant data oh okay that's what's all right yeah that's made from astronomic inside of the, yeah okay we can do can do that we're gonna be getting through a lot of these data cards I already know how to make data cards so that's not a problem they're being made in my in my uh, space space station but it's going to be another thing to think about and possibly I'm gonna to need to boost the um, the quantities I'm making all this stuff in because this is going to be oh, I don't know I mean it's all these data cards yeah, these made. Yeah, this is, there's a blank data card goes into each of these. That's a lot of observation frames. I'm gonna need to make a lot of these. But then again, that's another place I can use the beryllium if I want. I don't have to. That can come out. That can be made through with either steel or beryllium. Um, the steel one is actually quicker. Uh, I, I don't know. We'll see how much steel I've got up there. But if I'm firing beryllium at it with a uh, with a space with with one of my delivery cannons, then there's gonna be lo there's gonna be an essentially unlimited supply of beryllium up there. So I might go for just using that. Um, the glass may be an issue. I may need more delivery cannons on Norvis. We'll, 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 we'll see how it goes. 
but that is going to be for a future episode. Um, my next, my short-term plan is finish off this uranium facility here, get this up and running, make sure it runs. Oh look, we've run out of we've run out of um, fuel in this one now. The whole thing has cooled down. It's down at 500 degrees. So these are yeah, these are probably more or less stopping producing steam now. However, these are all still running because there's all the steam in the in the tanks up here. So it's basically working. Um, if, it, if I hadn't put those tanks in, with the lack of uh, fuel I've been putting in, these would all have shut down again by now. In fact, notice these ones are running as well, despite this having been shut down for ages, and you can't see any of it because I pulled up a radar because it was in the way of my, my power station. <laughs> oh, there was one other thing I did over here. Let's um, nip over and I'll point it out. And I can replace those radars on over there too. So over here, I've also put in um, these, these two water tanks. And the reason these are here is because it, it occurred to me that several of these processes output water um, and what I don't want to get to is in the situation where the the, uh, the offshore pump has pushed so much water into these pipes that these machines can't output and therefore the whole thing grinds to a halt even though there's lots of things in the base that use water <coughs> I don't know I want to make sure that the output water is being prioritized so what I've got is these two tanks here, and the only reason I put in two was to make piping easier. And these are being fed from the pump, which is going around here because, again, I, yeah, things are in the way. Um, and then they're linked up to it, so the pump is set to turn off if, when the tanks are f uh, at 15,000 water. So I think my base in general is um, is using more water than it's generated than it's um, producing. Uh, I could actually I could link these into here as well if I wanted to just to make sure to make sure as it was um, it's, it's definitely being using up enough but I haven't done that. Um, so this means that any time that there's sort of too much water in the system as it were, a little bit more can be buffered in these tanks so it, it won't it won't overflow and, and cause problems. So the thing I was going to say is these if you notice these um, these. Uh, turbines are still running quite happily off the steam in these tanks, even though the uh, these two these two uh, reactors have been turned off for ages. In fact, that one never turned on. There weren't enough um, fuel cells. I think out of the ten that came out, those two got four each, and that one got two. Uh, so, yeah, it's um, it, the system is working. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. And as you can see, there's oodles and oodles of steam here. Now, what I might do is nip over here. And to and have this have have a system in for turning this one off when there's plenty of electricity. Maybe shove in an accumulator, and any time, any time the accumulator's over or something, we'll um, I'll 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 stop use I'll stop the, uh, the the coal supply or something. But I can do that in a couple in, in a little while. Okay, I think that covers pretty much everything. Uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time when I'll have when I'll have finished off this um, uranium facility processing facility here, and should have got um, and should have done a bit more thinking about science. <laughs> we'll see how that goes because that's going to be complicated. I'll see you then. <laughs>